bringing the word this morning so uh, if you have your Bibles turn to Exodus chapter 15 verses 23 through 27 Exodus chapter 15 verses 23 through 27 you want to stand please for the reading of God's word I appreciate it very much appreciate everyone Exodus chapter 15, verses 23 through 27. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them, and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all of his statutes, 
I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. And they came to Elam, where were twelve wells of water and three score and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. Stretch your hands out toward me if you don't care to. Lord, I need the anointing. Lord, I've studied, I've prayed, but I need the anointing to bring this word. I can't do it without your anointing, O oh God. And I pray the anointing of the Holy Ghost will be upon me that you'll say what you want me to say. Do just exactly what you want me to do. Give me the strength to do this. Give me the ability that comes by the Holy Ghost to bring your word. I can't do it without the anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost. And I pray you'd anoint me in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen and amen. I'm going to lay a little foundation before I go into these verses that I've read. Israel, of course, had been slaves in Egypt for uh, 430 years. And in their bondage, they began to cry out to the Lord. The bondage got so terrible that they began to cry out to God to deliver them from the bondage that they were in. Um, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, hardened his heart and refused to let them go. Uh, you know, we know that God raised up Moses, raised up his brother Aaron to go and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. So God did raise up a deliverer. And uh, Pharaoh hardened his heart. He refused to let them go. And God sent ten plagues upon Egypt. And after each plague, Pharaoh would, keep, would say, I'll let you go, but he'd keep hardening his heart after the plague was gone. But God's getting ready to send the tenth and the final plague upon Egypt, which is the death of all the firstborn. And, and God tells Moses to tell the children of Israel to get them a spotless lamb, to slay that lamb, to put the blood of that lamb upon the two sides of the door and up over the door. And when the death angel passed over Egypt, when he saw the blood on the doors, he would pass over them and God's judgment would not come in and destroy them. Now just because Israel was God's people, that did not give them the right to ignore this command. They had to have the blood on their door or they would have been destroyed as well. You know, if the Egyptians would have uh, put blood on their door, God would have spared them too. Because the blood of Jesus is for all nations. It's for the Jew and the Gentile. So, wherever there was not blood on the door in Egypt, the firstborn died. The death of all the firstborn. Uh, it was the firstborn of all people. All the cattle, all the animals, sparrows firstborn, and the prisoner in the dungeon, those in the dungeon that were firstborn, they all died in Egypt. They did not have the blood applied. Israel would have been destroyed if they had not had the blood applied. And I'll tell you what, we need the blood of Jesus upon our heart's door or we're not going to survive. It's either the blood of Jesus or we're going to spend eternity in hell. We've got to have the blood of Jesus upon our heart. So when, when the death angel uh, went through Egypt and saw the blood on the doors, he passed them by. But in Egypt, the blood was not applied and the death of the firstborn took place. And after this uh, last plague, Pharaoh tells Moses and Israel to get out of Egypt. He, he tells them to go. Get out of Egypt. And... When Israel leaves Egypt, they leave in victory. They have spoiled the Egyptians. They've taken the wealth. They've taken the wealth of the Egyptians with them. God gave them favor in the sight of the Egyptians while they were there as slaves. He gave them favor. And they gave them the wealth, their, their, their gold and jewels. And this would later be used in the construction of the tabernacle. So... Israel left in victory, and they spoiled the Egyptians, took the wealth of Egypt with them. And this is an amazing thing. When Israel had first went into Egypt 430 years before that, they were 70 people. 70 people. 
And when they left Egypt, it's estimated there was from between 2 to 3 million people that left Egypt. God truly did keep His Word. He did bless and multiply them. It was in a time of hardship and a time of slavery and a time of rigor, but God multiplied them. And remember when the early church was being persecuted, that's when they grew during the time of persecution. The enemy can't stop the move of God. He can persecute and come against it. But God will uh, magnify it and let it grow and expand. And that's what happened in the early church. It grew and expanded. They reached the then known world. Look at Paul. Paul even went into Europe. So the gospel was spread to that part of the then known world. And it come in a time of persecution. And Israel... When they, uh, uh, here in Egypt, that's when they grew and expanded in a time of hardship and persecution. And God leads Israel on their journey by a pillar of a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And in whatever place that cloud lingered and stayed at, that was where Israel was to pitch their tents. They were to make camp wherever that cloud settled at. That was God that provided that cloud. And during the night, that would be a pillar of fire for their protection. That cloud and that pillar of fire was for their protection. So they, they follow that cloud. And the, and the first place they come to is by the Red Sea. That cloud stops by the Red Sea. But Pharaoh and his army, their hearts were hardened once again, and they decide to pursue Israel. And go after them and bring them back. God hardened their hearts. So they began to come against Israel. So Israel was trapped. The wilderness was behind them. The Red Sea was before them. And Pharaoh's army was closing in on them. But what seemed like a hopeless and an impossible situation, it, it's not for God. It, it, whatever's impossible with man is possible with God. God specializes in impossible, hopeless situations. This situation didn't take God by surprise. He knew Pharaoh was going to come after them. He knew that. But God made a way of escape for His people. God does specialize in the impossible. So He made a way of escape for the children of Israel. He told Moses to stretch his hand and his rod out over the sea. And God divided that Red Sea. And it wasn't a muddy path that they walked across. They walked across on dry ground. That path in the midst of the Red Sea wasn't muddy. It wasn't dirty. It was a clean, clear path that God made for the children of Israel. And that pillar of cloud stood behind Israel as they crossed to the other side, as every single one of them crossed, like you said in the Sunday school, Brother Richard, till their animals and chickens and whatever had crossed. Till every single thing had crossed. That cloud kept the Egyptians back till Israel got safely across the other side. And then God moves the cloud. And, the, and Pharaoh and the Egyptians, their hearts are still hardened. They decide to try to go after Israel. They went in, but their chariot wheels were broken. And then the sea come crashing in on them, drowning them. So God gave to Israel a great victory, a great deliverance. Uh, and of course, Miriam and the women began to sing praises to God. God is a glorious God. He strode the horse and the rider into the sea. Praise His holy name. He delivered them from the hand of Pharaoh. But Israel couldn't stay there. The cloud was leading them forward to a place called Shur. And Shur was a wilderness. And for three days in this wilderness, they went searching for water and found none. And then these verses that I've read, they now come to a place called Marah, the waters of Marah. But they soon discover that the waters of Marah are bitter. They cannot drink of these waters. They're bitter waters. If they drink of those waters, it will kill them. They will die. They're going to die of thirst. The waters are bitter. They need water. 
They need this water to live. So that's what Mara means is bitter. That's why these waters were called Mara. That means bitter waters. And I'll tell you, this world of sin is a wilderness. And the waters of this sinful world, they're bitter waters. There's people drinking the bitter waters. And it's going to kill them. They need the living water that comes from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They need that living water. Jesus said, if you drink of that water, you'll never thirst. Only Jesus can satisfy the thirsty soul of mankind. He's the only one that can fill that void that people are longing for, that they're looking for. We must drink of the water that Jesus has. If you drink of the, uh, of the waters of the world, you'll thirst. But if you drink of that water, you'll be satisfied. Jesus satisfies the thirsty soul. But we must drink of those waters that Christ has provided. And we'll never thirst again. Uh, verse 24, we see that Israel begins to murmur and to complain and speak against Moses because of this situation that they are now in. This was not Moses' fault. He was obeying God. Remember, this is where the cloud led them. Moses was just following what God instructed him to do. It was not Moses' fault. But they murmur and complain and gripe at Moses. In reality, they're speaking against the Lord God. Because the Lord God called Moses to be his servant to lead Israel out. So in reality, they're murmuring against God. They're complaining against God. God is the one that brought them here. So really, they're blaming God. Uh, the, the cloud provided by God had led them here to Marah. Sometimes the places God leads us to may not be pleasing to us. It may not please the flesh. Um, the trials and the tests that come our way may not be pleasing to us. We may not like them. It may be hard on us. But if God is leading us in a certain place, in a certain situation, we must not lose hope. We cannot grumble and complain. We must have faith in Him no matter how hopeless or dark a situation may be. If we're in the will of God, sometimes we're going to be in trials and troubles. But hold on to God. Look to Him. Don't murmur, grumble, gripe, and complain and give up and throw in the towel. He will see us through every problem, every situation, if we trust in Him and we believe in Him and we depend on Him. Whatever we may be going through, the Holy Ghost will comfort us and strengthen us. Whatever we may be going through. No, I jokingly say sometimes to people and myself and some of my family, I say, we must be kin to children of Israel. We grumble and gripe and complain about things. God at times will lead us to places and into circumstances where our faith will be tried. But we can't grumble, gripe, and complain. We must depend totally upon God, yield and submit and surrender totally to Him, and He'll make a way of escape. So when we are in a place or in a situation that is testing and trying us, let us not murmur, murmur gripe, and complain. Let us not blame others for the situation that God has placed us in. But look to Him. He will see us through anything we're facing. When we're in the will of God, things may not go as we think they should go. When we're in the will of God, things may not go as we planned. But if we're in the will of God, He'll see us through. He'll provide for us. He'll make a way of escape for us. We've got to stay in the will of God no matter how much it tries us, no matter how much it tests us. We've got to stay in the will and plan of God. We can't get out of His will and plan. He will make a way for us. We must hold on and hope in Him and believe in Him, not complain and gripe and bellyache. Moses and Israel were in God's will. They were in the place that God had led them to. And the place that God wanted them in that particular time. 
At this particular moment, at this particular time, this is where God wanted them, by the waters of Merah. That's where he led them to. So they were going through a severe test at this time. They were in God's will, however. They were where God had led them, even though they were in a wilderness where the waters were bitter and they could not drink of them. Wherever God leads you, you will have times of trouble and testing. But don't complain and blame others. Look to God. He will bring you through the difficulty. Israel asks Moses, what shall we drink? What are we going to do? These waters are bitter. What are we going to do? So in verse 25, we read that Moses begins to pray and to cry out to God for a solution to this problem that they are now facing. Moses was the leader of God's people, and he realized that he did not have the answer to this problem. He realized that, even though he was the leader of God's people. He didn't didn't know what to do. That's why he began to pray and seek the Lord, to give him the answer. Moses was only the under-shepherd. He had to look to the chief shepherd. He was only the under-shepherd. He had to get the answers from the chief shepherd. Uh, And our pastors and church leaders, they need to pray and seek the Lord as well. Sometimes we have this view of pastors and church leaders as super Christians that have the answers to every problem. They're only human. They've got to pray and seek God. They don't know everything. I'm glad for our pastors and church leaders, but they've got to depend on God for the answers. Moses had to depend on God at this time for the answer. He didn't know what to do, but he prayed and sought God. How, am I, how are we going to make these bitter waters sweet? How are we going to make them suitable to drink? He had to seek God. And our leaders in this day and time, our pastors, must pray and seek God. Lord, how do you want me to direct your people? What do you want me to preach and teach to your people? What decisions do you want me to make? See, Moses had to pray and seek God. And our pastors and leaders must pray and seek God for the answers. Moses didn't have all the answers. Our leaders and pastors don't have all the answers. They they are only human. They must look to the one who does have all the answers. They must look to the head of the church, Jesus Christ. He has the answers. They must have the direction of the Holy Ghost so that they will not make the wrong choices and the wrong decisions. That's why too many uh, bad decisions and wrong decisions have been made. They have not prayed and sought God. They have not listened to the Holy Ghost or, or been led by God's Word. But they, they, they must pray and seek God to know what to do, what to preach, what to teach. Our pastors and leaders must pray and seek God for direction for the church and not depend on their own wisdom, their own abilities, their own ideas and their agendas. They've got to go to the Word. They've got to look to the Word and pray and seek God and get the direction from the Holy Ghost. That's what they must do. They must look to the chief shepherd, Jesus. They must look to the head of the church, Jesus Christ. They must look to God's Word. They must depend on the Holy Ghost to lead them and guide them into all truth. So Moses begins to pray and to seek the Lord for the solution to these bitter waters. And if our pastors and church leaders will keep on praying and seeking God for the answers, God will give them the answers. It may not be the answer that they want, but it'll be the right answer because it comes directly from God. And they must be willing to obey what God tells them. So he gave Moses the answer. So God showed to Moses a tree that would make the bitter water sweet and suitable to drink. God showed to Moses a tree that had in it qualities that would cause these bitter waters to be made sweet. Uh, It wasn't just any tree God showed to Moses. 
It was the very tree that was to be used. And this tree is a symbol and a type of the cross of Jesus Christ. It's what this tree is a symbol of. There's only one hope. There's only one way to heaven. And that is the way of the cross. It's, I'm sorry, it's not the way of Buddha. It's not the way of Muhammad. It's not the way of uh, um, Joseph Smith or any of those other religious leaders. It's the way of Jesus Christ, the way of the cross. That's the only way to God. That's the only way to heaven. Oprah's got it wrong. There's not many ways to God. There's only one way. It's Jesus Christ. That's the only way to heaven. That's the only hope we have, the cross of Jesus Christ. That's the only way we can be forgiven of our sins and reconciled to God the Father is uh, the cross of Jesus Christ. That's the only way we can be saved from judgment. Only one way to heaven, and that is the way of the cross. The, the cross of Jesus Christ who died for our sins was buried and rose again. He's the only hope that we have. And Jesus, He is alive forevermore and seated at the right hand of God with all power and all authority, and He's forever making intercession for us. He's praying to God the Father on our behalf. As we pray and the Holy Ghost helps us to pray, Christ is there before God interceding for us, our great high priest. So Jesus is our only hope. He's all that we have. He's the only hope. So Moses cast this tree that God showed to him into these bitter waters. So Moses obeyed God completely. He didn't use another tree that he may have thought best to use, but he used the tree that God had showed to him. We must do things God's way. We've got to obey God completely in all things. We can't do things our way, not what we think is best. There could have been... Other trees around at that time that might have seemed more attractive to Moses and that he may have wanted to use. But God showed Moses the very tree to throw in those bitter waters. The very one. And Moses obeyed God. He didn't use the, the one he wanted. He, he, he obeyed God and put the tree in God showed him. Some may say God could have... Uh, redeemed us another way could he not but it, no it pleased the father to allow his son to be crucified to have the sins of the world placed upon him he who knew no sin never committed sin he allowed his son to be beaten and tortured and tormented his judgment was placed on Christ on, on, on that cross that's the way God chose there couldn't be no other way and Jesus, that plan was in motion before the foundation of the world. And as Moses was willing to obey God by putting that tree into those bitter waters, Jesus the Son was willing to go to the cross. Jesus did not have to go to the cross, but He willingly obeyed the will of the Father and went to the cross. Jesus even prayed... Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. What he was saying, if there's any other way. But they were, there wasn't. He said, nevertheless, not my will, not what I want, but your will be done. So he willingly went to that cross. He willingly died. And Moses willingly obeyed God and put that tree into those bitter waters. Uh, so when Moses threw in this tree that God had showed to him, into the bitter waters, they were made sweet. And if the cross of Jesus is cast into the bitter waters of a sinful life, those bitter waters of sin will be made sweet. Praise the Lord. Jesus makes a total change in the life of one that was a sinner. There's a total transformation. Changed. Forever changed. It doesn't matter how horrible the sin may have been. It doesn't matter how much evil they may have committed. When the cross is cast into the bitter waters of sin, all things are different. All things are new. And they're improved. The bitter waters of sin can be made sweet by the cross of Jesus Christ. 
That's the only hope. If any man or woman be in Christ, they are a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things, says all things are become new. Sin, sin has been forgiven. They're a new creation in Christ. The greatest miracle of all is when a sinner is completely changed and they become a saint of God. That's the greatest miracle when a life is transformed. Greatest miracle of all. When one is washed in the blood of Christ. And Christians, sadly, there are some who name the name of Christ that are drinking bitter waters. That's sad, but it's true. Uh, they're, not, they're not obeying God. They're drinking the bitter waters of strife, hurt, unforgiveness, anger. The Christian must also drink of the waters that have been made sweet by the cross. It's for the sinner and the saint. The waters that Christ has made sweet are for the sinner and the saint. We, must, we as Christians must also drink of the waters that have been made sweet. James says that, uh, that a fountain can't bring forth bitter water and sweet water. We, can, we can't be, we can't be uh, uh, a fountain of, of, of two different kinds of water. We can't, uh, we can't act any way, we, uh, any way we want to while we're not here in church. We've got to be the same outside as we are in here. Something's wrong if that's not the case. Because uh, uh, bitter water and sweet water don't come out of the same fountain. We've got to be witnesses for Christ. That's where it's at out here. We come in here to worship and to learn of God. But out here is the mission field. And we've got to shine the light of Christ. We can't be producing uh, bitter water and sweet water both. It's got to be one or the other. But sadly, Christians... Or some of them are drinking of the bitter waters. But we need to drink of those waters that have been made sweet by the cross. And here at the waters of Mary, God gave to Israel a statute. He gave to Israel a law and an ordinance. He said to them, a com a, He gives to them a commandment to be obeyed. And we have a statute, a law, and an ordinance from God to obey. It is the Word that is written in this book. We're to obey the words that are written in this book. Praise His holy name. We must obey God's Word. We must follow God's Word. We must obey, honor, and keep His Word. And there at Merah, God tested Israel to see if they would obey Him or they would not obey Him. He tested them there. That's what it says. God is going to allow us to be tested and tried. We're going to, God's going to allow trials and tests to come our way as Christians. God already knows if we're going to obey Him or not during the test and the trial. He already knows how we're going to react during the test and the trial. He, he already knows. He knows if we're going to obey Him or not during the trial. But these tests and trials are to draw us closer to God. They're not to destroy us. The trial and the test is for our benefit. It's going to show us whether or not we were going to obey God, whether we're going to trust Him or not, whether we're going to draw closer to Him or not, or we're going to draw away from Him. That's what the trial is going to show to us. Uh, it will expose the things in our lives that are not pleasing to God, and we need to repent of them be willing to repent of them and turn from them. And we will then see if we will yield and surrender everything to God or not during this test and trial. The trial is, is, is not to kill us or destroy us. It is to make us stronger and draw us closer to God and to come to that place where we are totally dependent and reliant upon Him. And it also makes us more like Christ. That's the purpose of the trial. But God did test Israel, and He proved them here at Merah to let them see whether or not they would obey Him. 
and to totally depend upon Him and rely upon Him. Uh, in verse 26, God tells Israel, if they will be totally obedient to Him and will depend totally upon Him and will listen to Him and obey His voice and do as He tells them to do, He tells Israel if they will do what is right in His sight and will give ear and will listen to and obey His commands and keep all of His statutes, that He will not bring upon them the diseases that He brought upon the Egyptians. The plagues that He brought upon the Egyptians will not hurt them if they obey. There's that word, if. It's conditional. This promise of God and all His promises are conditional. If we will obey Him, if we will follow Him completely. It was conditional for Israel. It's conditional for us today. These promises do have conditions. If we obey His Word, we will have His blessing. If we don't obey His Word and dishonor His Word, we're going to have a curse. It's either the blessing or the curse. It's either His blessing or, or we'll be cursed. If we don't obey His Word, we, we're going to be cursed. We either obey God and are blessed, or we disobey Him and are cursed. We can choose to obey Him and have life, or we can choose to disobey Him and have death. That's what it is, life and death. Life and death, show us. Daily we must choose to crucify self, crucify the old man, walk according to the Spirit, walk according to God's Word. We make that choice daily. Must die daily, put the old man to death daily. Not what self wants, but what God wants. And it's up to us. Uh, God will not force us to obey Him. He's not going to force us. He will, not, he will not make us obey Him. But we must willingly want to obey Him because we love Him. He's not going, I'm not talking about the name it and claim it junk. He's going to give you a Cadillac or a million dollars. God might bless somebody with a car or money, but He's not going to do that to everybody. He's not going to do that. That ain't what the, all this is talking about. It's talking about being blessed spiritually and drawn closer to Christ. That's what it means. Uh, so uh, we see that we obey God because we love Him. The reason why many Christians live a life of defeat is because they do not totally yield and surrender to God or obey His Word. They don't do what He wants them to do. They want to do their own thing. They want to live their own life. And then when they get in trouble, they want to call out to God to bless them. God's not going to bless a mess. God's not going to bless sin. He's not going to do that. Use God like He's some kind of genie or something. God don't work that way. God's not your genie. You don't demand God. God does what He pleases. You obey Him willingly because you love Him. God's not going to bless sin. Yeah, people want His blessings, but they don't want to pray. They don't want to read the Word. They don't want to fast. They don't want to seek Him. But when they're in trouble, they want His blessings. God don't work that way. God don't bless a mess. He don't bless sin. we got to obey God. Uh we got to we got to live a sanctified holy life. The Holy Ghost will not dwell nor anoint and use an unclean vessel. He won't. Got to obey God in all things, willingly, because we love him. God tells Israel none of these diseases of Egypt will come upon them because he is the God that heals them. God is our healer. I still believe in divine healing. I still believe in divine healing. I still believe that God heals. He heals all manner of sicknesses, illnesses, and diseases. The so-called incurable diseases, that's nothing for God. He can heal them. Jesus is still the great physician. He paid for our healing on Calvary with His stripes. We are and were healed. That's what the Bible declares. By the stripes of Christ, He purchased our healing. 
Praise His holy name. I don't understand why at times God doesn't instantly heal some people and some people He will raise up instantly. I don't, I don't know that. I don't know why uh, some die on their deathbed and some He raises up off the deathbed. I don't know why. But He's still a healer. He still heals. I know He's healed me. I know He's brought me out of death's door. Uh, but whether He heals me again or not, He's still a healer, and I still believe in divine healing, regardless of what I go through. If I never receive another healing, I know He's a healer. I believe in that. That's part of the, the teachings of our church. He purchased our healing on the cross. Praise His holy name. I do believe in divine healing. Praise His name. He can heal all manner of sicknesses and diseases. And just because somebody gets sick and has a disease, I'm talking about a saint now, just because they, a saint will get a sickness or disease, that don't mean they've sinned against God or don't, or, or don't have enough faith. God sometimes allows sickness to come and disease to come to, to make one more dependent on Him, to, to increase their faith, to, to perfect them. That's what He uses. Sometimes He allows that to come. That don't mean that they've done something wrong or don't have faith. And God uh, leads Israel out of Merah. We see in verse 27 that God leads Israel by the cloud to a place called Elam. And in Elam, they have plenty of water, 12 wells of water. That's 12 uh, wells, 12 tribes of Israel, one for each tribe. And 70 palm trees for their enjoyment. Of course, the, uh, the number 12 in the Bible is God's government. There were 12 tribes of Israel. There were 12 disciples, 12 apostles. And 70, that is God's perfect order. That's God's perfect number multiplied by 10. That's per, that means perfect order, 70. You know, the, Moses had the 70 men that assisted him. Jesus sent out 70. So that's God's perfect order multiplied. So God led Israel to a better place. They left Marah and were led to Elam. And if we hold on to God and trust Him during the fiery trials, He'll make a way for us and He will lead us to victory. Mara was the test. Now Elam is the place of victory. And they camp by, the, they camp by those wells. So we need to camp by the waters that Christ has provided. And they rested there. And we need to encamp by those waters and rest in Christ. When we go through the fiery trial and He brings us to victory, we keep dependent on Him. We rest in Him and believe and trust in Him. So they moved on from a test to a victory. We're going to have trials. We're going to have victories. It's going to be, we're going to have trials and tests throughout our life. We're going to have victories throughout our life. The only way we can have the victory is to pass the test during the trial. And we do that by depending on God, totally on Him. Believe in Him that He'll make a way. The sinner will only have peace if they will allow the cross to be thrown into their bitter waters. Those that are lost need to come to Christ and let Him cast that cross into their bitter waters. Cast that cross into the bitter waters of sin. Uh, I know a lie has been told, say when you come to Christ, become a Christian, all your problems are gone. That's not so. That's, I, that, I'd be lying to you if I said that. But you have someone to depend on when the trials come. You have someone to do, look to when the testing comes. When the bills are due and you don't know how they're going to be paid. When you got a sickness that you, or a disease that you don't know what the outcome's going to be. You've got one you can depend on. And He'll be there with you. The world, the sinners don't have that. They don't have Him to rely on and depend on. But when you are saved and trust in Him, you will have Him through the problem. And He'll see you through if you hold on to Him and trust Him and believe Him and obey Him. 
So God, if one will accept Him as as if that one will accept Christ as their Lord and Savior, He will make the bitter waters sweet, and God will lead them to a place of victory in their lives if they will trust Him. And Israel encamped by the waters of Elam after they left uh, Marah. So they had victory. They they they. Uh, got through the test. The living waters that Jesus has provided for us, we need to drink of them, and we need to rest in Him. Let us, let Jesus make our bitter waters sweet. We as Christians, we also face bitter waters at times. Uh, we've all been hurt by people, family, friends. We've had disappointments. We've lost family and loved ones to death. We went through all kinds of horrible things. People have lied on us. People have hurt us. Throw the cross into those bitter waters and let them be made sweet. If there are bitter waters of hurt, unforgiveness, anger, throw the cross in. Those bitter waters will be made sweet. Let that hurt be healed. Let forgiveness take place. Let the cross do the work. Yes, we Christians need to come to the cross as well as the sinner. We as Christians need our bitter waters made sweet also. We all need to come to the cross, both sinner and saint. Let us let the cross come into our bitter waters and they will be made sweet. The sinner comes to the cross to be saved. The Christian comes to the cross to stay saved and sanctified. If Moses had not obeyed God and cast that tree into those bitter waters, Israel would have died of thirst. Those bitter waters would have killed them. And if those who are lost, and Christians as well, do not stop drinking the bitter waters of the world, they too will die, both spiritually and physically. It's going to lead to death. Drink of the living waters of Jesus Christ. It is the only solution for the problems that we face. Jesus is the only one that can satisfy that thirsty soul. At least we can come play for us at this time. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. I want to give an altar call. I don't ever like to close a service without giving an altar call. I don't know if somebody is lost and undone without Jesus Christ. If the Holy Ghost is convicting you of sin, dealing with you, don't put it off, please. Come drink of the waters that Christ has made sweet. Don't be drinking those bitter waters of the world. It will lead to death. There's nothing there in those bitter waters. But Christ will make those bitter waters sweet. The cross will make them sweet. If anyone don't know Christ, please, if the Holy Ghost is convicting you, drawing you, please come. Please, don't put it off. Don't wait till tomorrow. We're only promised uh, now. Now's the time. Today's the day of salvation. None of us are promised another moment. We may not even make it out out the door. We don't know that. Please, don't put it off. The Holy Ghost is convicting you and drawing you, please. I'm going to open the altar here for a few moments. If anybody wants to come and needs to accept Christ as their Savior, please don't put it off. Please. Please. I'm like Brother Gann, I beg you. Please, I don't want to see anyone lost. I know he he don't. He's not willing that any should perish. All should come to repentance. You know, in a few moments, if somebody wants to come, if the Holy Ghost is convicting you and drawing you, we'll all, we'll all be willing to pray for you, pray with you. A few more minutes, a few more moments.
altar's still open. If you're a Christian and we all, you know, we're all human. Sometimes we might have took a drink of the bitter water, you know, unforgiveness, anger, jealousy. We don't, you know, we're not, we're, we're not, none of us perfect. But if we have, need prayer, come forward, we'll pray with you. If anybody needs prayer right now. Let's just all go ahead and come forward and pray at this time.